Thanks, George. Uh, thanks very much, everybody, for joining us on this beautiful day. Uh, it's uh, it's great to see all of you for an important uh, housing announcement. Uh, just before this media event, I had a chance uh, with uh, with uh, some of the folks who are here today to tour uh, the first uh, building that was redeveloped here on the Heather uh, site by Metro Vancouver. Uh, it's a beautiful building. It was completed in 2020. And uh, folks are all moved in and settled in, and uh, and you'll be hearing uh, from one of them in today's announcement. But it's part of an amazing neighborhood. There's great schools here. There's good amenities. There's a great bakery. Uh, we we're just having a conversation about the best place to grab coffee. Uh, this is a neighborhood that is established, and there's all the infrastructure is already here. Uh, so finding ways uh, to make sure that people can actually afford to live here, uh, can find a way to build a home here, is so important. And I want to thank everybody who was involved in that work. Um, our government's commitment around housing uh, is to uh, do everything possible uh, to address the housing crisis, every imaginable avenue uh, that we can take uh, to make sure that people have uh, an ability to build a decent life in our province, to afford a good home for themselves and for their families. And that means taking action on short-term rentals, where people are buying up whole homes and condos and converting them into hotel rooms. Um, or that means, uh, as government, buying land new near uh, new transit stations to make sure that the people who actually use transit can actually afford to live near transit, using underused public land to build attainable middle-income housing. Uh, and it also means uh, working with nonprofits that operate uh, housing to get more housing units built and to serve people better uh, across uh, the spectrum of incomes that we have here in the province. Um, there is a discussion in the province about what the best path is forward right now. There are huge strains uh, caused by rising global costs, central bank uh, interest rates, uh, and, uh, and you can see them uh, as the global economy slows, you can see those impacts in our provincial budgets. And the debate is, is now the time to cut back and reduce those services to stop uh, uh, moving forward, uh, to, to cut back and cancel uh, projects that are going to make life better for people around housing and so many other areas, new hospitals, new schools, transit, roads, or is now the time more than ever uh, for the province to step up and support people? Well, we've answered that very clearly. We believe that now is the time to support people with the big challenges that they face, and uh, it's a discussion that will be ongoing over the next few months, uh, but I think critical, more important than ever, uh, that we're responding to the massive population growth we're seeing in the province, the big challenges around housing, around delivering high-quality health care and education and public services that people count on well, supporting people with the cost of living. Today's announcement is part of that. Uh, the, uh, uh, a lot of people, when you say Metro Vancouver, uh, they think of critical infrastructure, sewers, water treatment, uh, that kind of stuff, but Metro Vancouver is one of the largest non-profit housing providers in the province of British Columbia. Uh, serving about 10,000 people. And uh, last year, we signed an agreement with Metro Vancouver to work with them to develop about 2,000 units of housing on 10 sites that are owned by Metro Vancouver. And uh, this uh, building uh, that's under uh, construction behind me is part of that first phase of that work that we did together in, uh, in developing additional units on these sites. And it included homes in Burnaby and Coquitlam and Pitt Meadows. Well, today I'm here to announce that phase two of this plan is moving forward. We'll be delivering four additional uh, affordable housing developments, including a third building for Heather Place, where we are right now, actually on the site where we're standing right now, as well as sites in Coquitlam and in North Vancouver. And we're also committing to the third phase of the plan to meet our commitment for those 2,000 units of housing across Metro Vancouver. Without question, to address the housing crisis, all levels of government have to work together. The municipal governments, the provincial government, the federal government, First Nations governments, uh, and regardless of, uh, of the level of government, if we're not all pulling together, we're not going to be able to address it the way that we should. Uh, so I'm very grateful to be joined here today by uh, Metro Vancouver, uh, by local governments that are supportive of these kinds of initiatives, and to pledge the commitment and the ongoing commitment of the province of British Columbia to ensure that everyone can build a good life here in the province and a home that they and their families can afford. Thanks for joining us, and I'll turn it back over uh, to Minister Heyman. Thank you so much, Premier. And of course, we're also joined by uh, Chief Administrative Officer of Metro Vancouver, Jerry Dorbovolny, and I noticed Councillor Re Rebecca Bly has also joined us. Um, the housing development behind us is just one of many, as the Premier's noted, that are underway to build homes for people 
and ease the housing shortage in our community. I'm particularly happy to be standing in front of uh, the building that's going up and on the site of another building because in 2013, when I was first elected, housing was a critical issue as it still is in this constituency and Heather Place in the old buildings that preceded the beautiful new one you see on the right was filled with people concerned about their future living in buildings that they knew needed to be replaced they didn't know what would come next so I want to personally thank Metro Vancouver for making the changes and responses that were necessary to assure the tenants that they would continue to have a place living here in a new Heather place if they wanted to and the ones I've talked to who moved into new units are so appreciative to share more about what we're doing to tackle the housing affordability crisis I'd like to invite Minister Ravi Kalon to the podium Thanks, Bruce. Appreciate it. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, George. And I too want to acknowledge that we're on the territory of the Coast Salish peoples, uh, Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil -Waututh nations. And of course, housing affordability is a key issue that we're working to address. Uh, the housing market has had a profound effect on every single household in uh, British Columbia. In fact, I would argue across the country. Population increases, global inflation, rising interest rates, equals pressure on the housing market. We have had in uh, more than 20,000 homes delivered here in Metro Vancouver through direct investments as well as through legislative changes. Metro Vancouver's MOU that we assigned was about adding 2,000 new and uh, redeveloped uh, homes here in Metro Vancouver. And phase two, of course, uh, announced today, kicks off nearly 700 uh, homes that will be new homes that will be uh, built within our partnership with, with Metro Vancouver. We are contributing uh, approximately $226 million to this next phase of projects, um, building on more than 600 homes that were part of phase one uh, that uh, we had brought forward uh, last year. Uh, the projects that are identified in this phase include 670 new and redeveloped units with approximately 515 of those are being net new units. So we have redevelopments uh, at uh, Malaspina phase two in Coquitlam. Uh, there's a redevelopment of Park Court in Coquitlam. New development called Riverside Drive in North Vancouver. Uh, I'm sure the mayor will be uh, speaking about uh, the exciting that is for the community. And of course, uh, here, Heather C. Development, uh, in partnership with Vancouver. And um, I think it's important to say that the first phase of Heather Place A, which is just across from us here, uh, has already opened. It's got 67 units that are open for low and middle income families. Uh, people are already moving in, which is really exciting to, to see. And to see people moving in there and knowing there's more people moving into this amazing neighborhood is, is quite uh, exciting. Uh, this, all of this is in partnership with local governments. And it, this isn't by itself. We have four themes that we focus on with our Homes for People strategy. First is of course addressing speculation in the marketplace speculation and vacancy tax, ensuring that people that have homes, that have investment homes, uh, are actually renting them and not leaving them empty. Uh, second is, of course, reducing red tape to get more housing built through small-scale multi-unit, to get more transit-oriented development, and a lot of that is happening here in Vancouver. And third piece is to address the existing housing stock and ensure that we're able to protect housing through the Rental Protection Fund. And I was excited to be in Vernon yesterday to announce uh, more homes that were being protected and renters being protected along the way. And of course, lastly, nothing can be done about the housing crisis without governments dire directly investing in affordable housing. And that's what we're doing here uh, in partnership with Metro Vancouver. So I'm excited about the partnership. I'm excited about all of our local government partners working together with us to ensure that we have housing available for people in our communities. So I'll pass it back to uh, Minister uh, Heyman. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Ravi. This is uh, such a great uh, announcement, the continued commitment of the government of uh, British Columbia to support people with housing across the province. I'd now like to invite uh, Vancouver Councillor Peter Meisner of the Metro Vancouver Housing Committee to share more about our partnership and the projects that we're helping with for the people in Metro Vancouver. Thank you, uh, Minister Heyman, for that uh, uh, very kind introduction. 
Uh, I'd like to also acknowledge uh, with much honour and respect on behalf of Metro Vancouver that uh, our regional district is located on the 10 shared uh, territories of 10 First Nations. Uh, so today we're gathered here on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh people. And on behalf of Mayor Sim and City Council, I welcome all of you to Vancouver on this beautiful afternoon. So I'm not just joining you as a Vancouver City Councillor today, I'm also joining you as a member of uh, Metro Vancouver's Housing Committee where we're working to provide more affordable rental housing across the region through our nonprofit Metro Vancouver Housing. And I'm so proud to be part of this committee and this organization that provides thousands of affordable homes for families and people across Metro Vancouver. Uh, so important uh, every day but especially uh, in the housing crisis that we find ourselves uh, in right now. So the Metro Vancouver re region is an amazing uh, place to live as we all know but unfortunately we hear all too often from people who are struggling to keep a roof over their heads. And housing affordability is one of the greatest stresses for people in Metro Vancouver and all orders of government are working together to address this issue. We know that people need safe affordable places to call home if we are to address the affordability issues facing our region. So that's why Metro Vancouver Housing and BC Housing have joined forces on a multi-phase collaborative plan to build thousands of good, safe, affordable homes throughout the region. Metro Vancouver Housing is one of the largest nonprofit housing providers in BC with a 50 year plus track record of developing and operating safe and secure places to live. Today we serve close to 10,000 people with 3,400 affordable rental homes at 49 sites across the region. As mentioned behind us you see one finished building that's Heather Place A and we're working on a second one and we have space uh, for a third building. So the first new building on this site Heather Place Building A opened in July 2020 and that has 67 uh, new units. In 2023 Metro Vancouver signed an agreement with BC Housing to support the creation and renewal of thousands of more homes throughout the region. And the first phase of that agreement supports 660 new affordable homes and five construction projects are currently underway. The building behind us, the wood frame building, is Heather Place B and when that's complete we'll have 87 new units for low and moderate income families, seniors and people with disabilities. And in addition to that, Heather Place C has been mentioned right where we're standing. That will be a larger building under the Broadway plan and that will have uh, many more new units. So in addition to generous provincial funding, Metro Vancouver is contributing land and cash equity valued at more than $367 million over 10 years and is also working hard to leverage more federal support. The projects funded, funded under this agreement will see us adding or redeveloping much needed affordable homes for seniors and people with disabilities as well as families throughout uh, Coquitlam, North Vancouver and Vancouver. And, Met and BC Housing has continued uh, to be a long time generous supporter of our efforts uh, to bolster the region's housing supply. And Metro Vancouver Housing is very grateful for the ongoing support and trust of BC Housing and we look forward to working together in the future to deliver the final and third phase of Heather Place coming soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter, for your remarks, for the partnership. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing the results of more investments in the future. I'd now like to invite Mayor Mike Little of the District of North Vancouver to speak on how this investment will benefit his community. First of all, this is the coolest. And I've got a mic stand that goes up and down. I think I have the premier to thank for, uh, for, for that. Uh, my name is Mike Little, Mayor of the District of North Vancouver, and it's my pleasure to uh, be here with you today uh, to recognize this important milestone in producing uh, safe and affordable housing in our community. Uh, for the District of North Vancouver, we've been working very hard with the provincial government and other agencies to be able to produce uh, affordable housing in our community uh, in a very challenging environment where we have supply chain issues, labor issues, and we, it's very hard to put together a project with all of the financing in the right place and, and, and make it happen. Uh, and so what has to happen is all of our agencies need to get rid of the barriers, work together, and try to all contribute in ways to produce genuinely affordable housing. And one of our challenges is that uh, we've been participating with Metro Vancouver on the housing side for, for a very long time. And about 
even though there's 10,000 units produced, we actually didn't have any in the District of North Vancouver. And so our council, when they were elected, decided that that was one of the projects they wanted to deliver on in our community. And we set out to identify a site. We put the proper zoning in place in order to be able to uplift it and make sure that it had uh, a viable project that could be uh, uh, put together there. And, and so it was that commitment from our council to seek out this project and try to get near the top of the pile as best we can because we want to be a part of the solution too. We want to make sure that our community has a mix of housing including affordable and safe family oriented housing and the Riverside Maplewood community is going to be a fantastic place for, for the people who are coming into this. It's walkable, it's safe, there's lots of services in that area and so I think we're all going to be very proud of what we can produce in that space. It not only takes us all breaking down the barriers between our organizations and working with the region, the province, the municipalities to make that uh, deep dive affordable option available in our community, but I did want to say one other additional special thank you today. Uh, we can't do this without the construction workers who are committing to come to our communities and be in our communities and help us build these facilities. Uh, sometimes it's not always a beautiful sunny day like this and uh, you overcome incredible challenges to produce this housing. But without your commitment, we can't build it. And so I did just want to say that uh, on behalf of the District of North Vancouver, thank you to the partners for coming together uh, uh, to be able to make this happen. Thank you to our community for supporting us in, in setting aside the land for this purpose, but also wanted to say a great big thank you to all of the construction workers and people who are actually going to put this project together for our community. We can't do it without you. So on behalf of our community, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mike, and uh, I know we all join you in thanking the workers who and the other workers who will be on this site building these projects. Uh, they do a great job. I'd now uh, like to invite uh, one of the residents of Heather Place, Monica Tayag, to the podium to share her story about how housing projects like this one make a difference in her life and uh, we had an interesting conversation just before we came out here. Uh, I don't want to tell Monica's story but she's got a long history with this site. I'd like to begin by expressing my gratitude for the childhood I had and my home on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh na nations. Although low income, my childhood was rich in nearby green spaces and playground options. Growing up, us neighborhood kids would meet on the slides, play until bedtime, only to meet the next evening, the evening after, and the evening after that. The long-awaited transition to the new Heather Place has been uplifting. Although the new processes present new difficulties, such as daunting rent assessments, looming threats of eviction, and a decrease in the sound of children playing outside due to tenant complaints. Despite this, Metro Vancouver, Metro Vancouver Housing Corporation's efforts of community engagement and sustainability are commendable. Heather Place provides a certain peace of mind and a chance to enjoy life beyond financial burden which could not be achieved without the dedication of our building managers and on-site staff members. Affordable housing is a basis for life-changing opportunities, and I believe this project reflects Metro Vancouver's dedication to us residents, and Heather Place will serve as an example of how communities thrive by supporting each other and changing the course of hundreds of lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica. It is, uh, it's such a, a joy to hear your story. <clears throat> I know that people who've lived in, in Heather Place have formed and will continue to form a great community here. Uh, we now uh, have time for questions. I think, Jimmy, you're going to moderate it. Over to you. Person as well as those on the phone line. For those on the phone line, please press star one to enter the queue, and you can unmute your phones right now, and you'll only be audible when you get called upon. Uh, all members of the media will be limited to one question and one follow-up. We're going to begin on the floor today with Penny Dufflos from CTV News. Go ahead, Penny. Hi, Framer. I just wanted to start out with a question for a colleague. Uh, in January, you promised the public answers in the death of six-year-old Dante Lucas. Now that criminal proceedings have ended, are we going to see a public inquiry in this case? Uh, thanks, Penny. Um, this is a, a horrific uh, case, a terrible uh, death of a child uh, under appalling circumstances that uh, resulted in 
criminal charges and convictions. For the province's uh, side of this, our duty, our obligation to get answers both for uh, policymakers on our side uh, to make sure that the province uh, does everything we can to prevent this from ever happening again, but also for the public so that they have clarity about what went wrong and what's being done to address those issues. There are two processes that are underway. Uh, the first is the representative for children and youth is under, undergoing a thorough uh, investigation and will report out publicly. Also the coroner uh, is doing a full investigation of this death. Both of these uh, investigations were held up by the criminal process. Uh, they are not allowed to uh, uh, interfere in that uh, criminal process and so they wait until that's concluded and so th that work is well underway. Uh, there's also ongoing litigation, uh, as I understand it, in civil court as well. Uh, the answers will be given to the public about what happened and what is being done to address uh, uh, that terrible death uh, and, uh, and how we're going to prevent them in the future. And Penny, do you have a follow-up question? I do. Um, I know cybersecurity has been a, a really big issue for your government right now and the hack from the First Nations Health Authority, there's already material on the dark web. So I want to know, are you going to be committing to more resources, whether that's uh, people, whether that's money for provincial agencies and related agencies like health authorities to try to combat what seems to be a rising threat? Well, there's no question, uh, and I, I think British Columbians, you see it too on your cell phones and, uh, and uh, in your online transactions, there is a growing cyber threat uh, to information and to our financial security as British Columbians. And it's not unique to us, it's worldwide. Uh, we have seen high profile retailers like London Drugs uh, be the victim of ransomware and now uh, the First Nations Health Authority. For our part internally within the provincial government, uh, in uh, 2022, we deployed additional resources to be able to uh, detect and prevent cyber threats. That enabled us to do uh, to detect and uh, and uh, begin the work of addressing uh, the uh, the cyber attack we've faced uh, from a state level actor here in British Columbia. And for uh, health authorities and those other agencies that are arm's length from government, especially First Nations Health Authority, uh, our commitment is to provide uh, the support that they need uh, to respond to this and also to prevent uh, these types of attacks from happening. It's hard to think of information more sensitive to people than health information. And, uh, and our commitment is to First Nations Health Authority to support them with whatever they need to respond to this very serious incident. Our next question will come from Will Dinette Paul from Radio Canada. Go ahead, Will Dinette. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, so I just want to add to that question regarding uh, cyber attacks. After what happened to the uh, BC First Nations Health Authority, how concerned are you about this type of event? And also, do we have the tools here in BC uh, to deal with those uh, cyber attacks? Um, these, uh, these three very high profile incidents that took place in very close uh, timing, the London drugs incident, the state level actor attack on British Columbia, and the uh, First Nations Health Authority hack uh, are uh, close in time, but as, as best we understand it, unrelated. Uh, the threat to uh, people's information and their financial security is very real and growing uh, worldwide. And our uh, internal uh, government processes for core government have included upgrading our defenses, which enabled us to detect uh, the attacks we were facing at the provincial level. And uh, we continue to support all of the agencies that we deal with, uh, whether they're health authorities or universities and colleges uh, and others in, uh, in upping their game uh, to be as ready as possible, knowing that. Uh, uh, that there will always be challenges like this, but to prevent as many of them as possible because uh, when we talk about the information that these agencies have, whether it's health information or uh, personal financial information, uh, it's a big deal for British Columbians. And so uh, we uh, will reach out to the First Nations Health Authority we have uh, and offered uh, all the support that they need and, uh, and uh, we'll continue to provide that support to arm's length agencies uh, across the province. And Will Dinette, you have a follow-up question. Thank you. Um, so, question regarding the evacuees in Fort Nelson. We know some of them won't have any homes to return in. Uh, so I wonder, um, in terms of support, what type of support the province is willing to give to those evacuees in Fort Nelson? Thanks. Um, so it's, uh, it's early days in, uh, in Fort Nelson, but our hope is that people are going to be able to return to their homes soon. Uh, there were some structures that were burned down and the wildfire service along with the local government is doing an assessment of the structures that were lost and notifying those property owners of the damage um, that 
may have been caused during the fire. I'm incredibly grateful to the wildfire service uh, and to the uh, regional uh, government, First Nations governments, for working so closely with us and for their exceptional and heroic work uh, to protect the town. Uh, there was a period of time there uh, when the entire uh, town of Fort Nelson could have burned down and Fort Nelson First Nation. And, uh, and, uh, but for the efforts of our amazing fire crews, um, and, uh, and we're not out of the woods, it's a long fire season ahead, but it would have been a lot worse. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we're probably going to have to do a lot of uh, announcements like this, a lot of work with different communities across the province this summer as we face really dry conditions uh, and uh, on the heels of a record-setting forest fire season just last year. Um, but, uh, but this was an example of all of us working together. And, uh, and for those uh, people who have lost uh, structures, maybe it's a home, maybe it's uh, some kind of, uh, of industrial building, uh, we'll be working with the local government to respond and, uh, and provide support however we can. Our next question, we'll go to Paul Johnson from Global News. Go ahead, Paul. Thank you. This is actually a, a question for Minister Callan, if you're available to respond to this. We are hearing from some uh, advocates for affordable housing in the city of Vancouver who are critical of what they say is a city of Vancouver report that appears to be setting an upper limit on densification of a certain neighborhood known as Shaughnessy One. And I'm curious, Minister, if you're aware of this and if you have any response to it. Your government has been out front saying the province is going to try to encourage densification where it's needed. Have it over to you. Great. I'll wait for the podium to lower. Just kidding. Um, you know, for, uh, first off, I, I, I'm, I believe um, with my whole heart that the mayor and the council are committed to ensuring that there's housing available for all people in Vancouver. And I think they're, they will reach their targets because I know they're committed to reaching those targets. But it's important for everyone in the community across the province, Metro Vancouver, to know that all communities are playing their role. And so when a community like Shaughnessy has uh, the opportunity to have housing being built, it's important that those steps are being taken. Now, I understand this is a recommendation from planners. Council will have to deliberate on the recommendations and, and provide their feedback. So there is lots of time for that to happen. Uh, but I think it's important for people to know that uh, all the housing that we need is not being built just in low and middle income communities, that all communities are playing their part. And, uh, and that's my hope and my expectation for all communities is that we have issued site center documents. We would like to see all communities have the similar level of housing being available to communities, whether they're Shaughnessy or they're East Vancouver. Um, and that rising podium means I'm done and I have to move out of the way. <laughs> That's not, you're done. <laughs> I got the remote control in my pocket. <laughs> Our next question will come from Wolf Deppner from Black Press. Go ahead, Wolf. the Premier uh, or anyone else who wants to weigh in as well on this one. Um, the uh, Food, Banks, uh, Food Banks Canada recently put out a report that came out yesterday and uh, it gave uh, British Columbia a D plus uh, overall on issues of poverty, housing, and on. Uh, but the province gets, uh, gets an F on uh, uh, people spending uh, more than 30% of income on housing, people having, ac having trouble accessing health care, and uh, also when it comes to um, support uh, for individuals who live below the poverty line. Uh, what's your government's response uh, to this report? Well, the, uh, the issues face facing many British Columbians around affordability are serious and ongoing. Today's announcement is just one example of how we're responding to uh, one of the biggest drivers of affordability for people, which is the cost of housing. Um, and for British Columbia, when the Bank of Canada raises interest rates at a record pace that we've never seen before, uh, it, uh, it has a disproportionate impact. This has always been a more expensive place to live. But when people are renewing their mortgages, when they're seeing uh, their debt payments go up dramatically, uh, it, uh, it impacts um, affordability for them generally. And this has a, a very significant impact, impact on those who are most vulnerable. Uh, that's why we put in place a whole series of uh, initiatives to address uh, poverty in British Columbia. We established a plan and a strategy out of the gate to identify communities that were particularly struggling and then targeted um, interventions to support them. So whether that's seniors with our recent announcement around SAFER to support them with rents, whether that's a universal breakfast program for kids uh, going to school to make sure they're not going to school hungry. 
uh, whether that's our subsidized childcare program, uh, where parents uh, who are living at the poverty line are seeing uh, rates for childcare that are below uh, our $10 a day target, and in some cases are entirely free, so that they can uh, both support their families and know that their kids are, are being looked after with the higher, highest standards of care. Uh, we know we've got a lot of work to do to respond to this, and, uh, and it means things like uh, being able to provide that rebate through BC Hydro, which means a lot to very low-income people, or uh, the rebate through ICBC and freezing the rates for two more years for basic insurance when you're dependent on that car to get to work to be able to support your family. Uh, and uh, astonishingly, these are initiatives that, uh, that are opposed <laughs> by uh, John Rostad and Kevin Falcon. Uh, they uh, had the opportunity to put them in place when they were in government. They didn't do it. And, uh, and uh, not only did John Rustad oppose the ICBC rebate, he says he wants to return the insurer back to where it was before, facing double-digit rate increases for drivers uh, as, a, as a gift, I guess, uh, to personal injury lawyers. So uh, we're going to stay focused on supporting people with these big challenges with announcements like today's announcement to really make a meaningful difference wherever we can with the cost of daily life. And, uh, and that's our commitment to them as a government. And Wolf, do you have a follow-up question? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, the report, uh, as well as uh, any number of uh, advocates, have also argued uh, for an increase uh, in social assistance rates uh, for individuals uh, that, uh, that currently live below the poverty line and having issues with uh, uh, social assistance and so on. And, and I realize we're still a little bit out from the election, uh, but the report also makes the point that, that uh, all parties uh, should sort of uh, make, uh, uh, make an effort to uh, reduce poverty, uh, uh, poverty rates in, in British Columbia. And which specific policies uh, can British Columbians expect uh, when it comes to uh, reducing poverty rates um, um, announced uh, li later on in the fall and beyond? Thank you. Well, I'll tell you, Wolf, uh, it's a bit laughable uh, that the other parties care about the issue of poverty and people living below the poverty line, given their track record. John Rustad and Kevin Falcon sat around the table and decided that the minimum wage wasn't low enough. They established a training wage that was even lower than the minimum wage. When we formed government, we had the lowest minimum wage in Canada. Uh, now we have the highest, and we were told we couldn't have that in British Columbia because if we did, it would kill the economy. Well, uh, guess which province added the most jobs last month of any province in Canada, not per capita, just the most jobs in the private sector, it was British Columbia. Guess which province grew the fastest post-pandemic of any of the large provinces of Canada? That was British Columbia. Uh, guess which province uh, is the only province uh, with a AAA credit rating and the third lowest debt to GDP ratio? All these measures, uh, these are the measures that we were told we couldn't achieve if we looked after people who were struggling and had a decent minimum wage. We now have the highest minimum wage in Canada. We increased social assistance uh, three times. We in increased disability assistance. Uh, we doubled the senior supplement. Uh, we expanded safer availability for seniors uh, looking for a place to rent. We have a universal breakfast program for kids. I could go on. But all of these pieces were available under the previous administration, and they didn't do it. And what people can expect if there is a John Rustad or Kevin Falcon government, who knows who's going to be running or what their party name is going to be come October. But whoever it is, if they get back into power, they will cut those programs because that is exactly what they did when they were elected in 2001. They cut the affordable daycare program that the NDP had put in place and eliminated that for a generation, and they will do it again. Next question will be from Angela Bauer from City News. Go ahead, Angela. Hi there. The question is, are you able to address how many families and individuals are on a wait list to get into a unit like Heather Place, and how long is the wait in years? Uh, so uh, Metro Vancouver might be a better place. I don't know if they um, are, oh, Ravi can do it. Um, but, but broadly, uh, we know that demand is huge for units like this. Uh, we have uh, in the neighborhood of uh, 73,000 uh, units that have either been uh, delivered or in process right now. Uh, we have to work closely with cities to get these units built. Once they're funded, to get those units into the ground as quickly as possible. We have too many units that are funded but being held up, and while they're held up, costs continue to rise and, uh, and making those projects uh, less affordable going forward. So that's why I'm glad to have uh, key city representatives here committing to fast process to get these buildings built as quickly as possible. Yeah, Robin? Yeah. Yeah, 
Oh, oh, we have a special guest. Thanks. <laughs> you just introduce yourself first before you speak. We'll have to lower it a lot. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Heather McNall. I'm Deputy CAO at Metro Vancouver of Policy and Planning. And just uh, so you know where we get our wait lists from uh, at Metro Vancouver Housing, for all of our low uh, rent geared to income uh, units, we use the BC Housing uh, list, wait list for that. And it's an extensive list for the Lower Mainland, over 20,000 right now. Um, and then uh, the other units that we have are low end of market, and those we advertise uh, regularly uh, through through channels. Thanks. And Angela, would you like a follow-up question? Yes, and uh, who gets priority in the units? Or how do you prioritize? Um, grab you on. Yeah. Sure. Thanks for pitching in. Uh, thanks so much again for the question. Uh, we have a 10-year plan where we have targets for at least 30% of our units being at rent geared to income, and those are areas where rents don't exceed 30% of a household's uh, gross family income. And so uh, when, when units become available, we assess across our entire uh, portfolio and see where we're at in terms of that. And so we have 30% uh, at least that are at rent geared to income, and the rest are at low end of market. We have time for one more question. We're going to go to Richard Zisman from Global News. Go ahead, Richard. Um, Premier, considering the decision by the courts today on the future of policing in Surrey, do you believe that Mayor Brenda Locke and her council has been wasting taxpayers' money by attempting to draw out a transition that, that your government has described as inevitable all along? Uh, thanks for the question, Richard. Uh, we received an important decision uh, from the court today on the Surrey Police transition, confirming, uh, as we uh, hoped and expected, uh, that the province uh, does have the ability to direct Surrey to continue and finish the transition that they started to the Surrey Police Service. This is obviously a huge relief for the people of Surrey who just want this done. Uh, I want this done. Everybody wants this done. And it's so important uh, that we take this moment, uh, and I encourage uh, uh, the mayor and council uh, to take this moment. The province is there uh, to close this chapter and move on. The longer this transition takes, the more it costs. There's only one taxpayer. The province is committed to support Surrey with the cost of transition to make sure that individual taxpayers are not on the hook for it. And uh, we can partner, get this done quickly, and make sure that the costs are minimized because there are so many other challenges that the city of Surrey faces as the fastest growing municipality in British Columbia and one of the fastest, if not the fastest growing in Canada. And uh, there's lots for us to work on. And the core thing for me and for the people of Surrey is that uh, this needs to wrap up and we all need to move on. And Richard Dale, follow up question. Uh, Premier, you mentioned ICBC in an earlier answer, uh, pointing to a policy that the Conservatives have put in place around a move uh, back, uh, in essence, away from no fault uh, and towards uh, privatization. Um, what do you make of the concerns some British Columbians have raised that they don't feel supported by the new system, the enhanced care system? In some cases, people don't believe they've been made whole when involved uh, in an accident uh, that was no fault of their own. Uh, thanks, Richard. Uh, one of the commitments we made to British Columbians when we brought in the new system was we do a review at the five-year mark of implementation to make sure that we were able to identify any issues. Of course, issues have come up with the new system as we move forward uh, that we had to address issues around pedestrians and cyclists and other pieces as we put the new model in place. Uh, we have addressed those issues, but there may be others. And so uh, by doing that review, uh, we'll be able to close any additional gaps that may be in place. But what I can tell you that is this. I saw the old system up close. And, uh, and uh, I know it's a, I'm the son of a personal injury lawyer, uh, so there's no inherent prejudice here. Uh, but I can tell you that the beneficiaries of the old system were lawyers. It was not drivers who paid double-digit increases every year. Uh, it was not people who were injured in crashes who paid 30% of their award that was supposed to pay for their care for the rest of their life in legal fees at least. That amount does not include the money that was loaned to them by the lawyers as they went through multi-year court battles waiting for money to pay for their care. Right now, you get care immediately following the accident if you're injured. Um, one of the things that it's important to remember around the reforms is that we are now in our sixth year of 0% increases on basic insurance. Is there anything in the world that has seen 0% increases for the last six years 
That is um, how significant these reforms are and the savings they're generate, generating for British Columbians of uh, almost $500 per person. It is astonishing to me that the Conservatives would look at that. Six years of 0% increases, four rebates, and ICBC still putting money in the bank to lower rates for the future and say, you know what, we want to undo that. And there's only one reason that they would do that. It's for the personal injury lawyers. And I noticed that they voted against the reform of oversight of lawyers in the province. This opens up uh, support for families going through family law disputes with minor legal issues to be represented by a paralegal or be supported by a notary. It's something that unfortunately we weren't able to reach agreement with the Law Society about to provide affordable legal services for British Columbians. Again, when John Rustad had the choice to stand with British Columbians and say, you have the right to affordable legal services in British Columbia. You have the right to affordable insurance. Uh, instead, he's standing again uh, with those same lawyers that worked so hard to fight those ICBC reforms that are benefiting British Columbians. I think this is an important mark of character, an important mark of where he wants to take the government of British Columbia if he's elected, and it's important that British Columbians know that. And that's all the time we have for today. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Thanks, everybody.